Today's video is sponsored by Six Foot Tall Tumbleweed. Listen to the new album Wheel of Suffering on iTunes or on Spotify today. Dark skin, bright eyes, big booty, and thick ass thighs. Hello everybody, Brad the Guitologist here. In today's video we're going to take a look at a black rhinoceros's butthole. Or no, actually it is a mystery amplifier. What's under the cover? Oh, it's another Mesa Boogie. So this should be a fun one. I always love working on Mesa Boogies. This one is a uh, dual caliber DC3. It's two channel amplifier. As you can see here, we have some uh, EQ. We have a master volume on the channel. We also have an output level. We can switch between lead and ry uh, rhythm here with this front switch. We can also use the foot switch. Gain, treble, mid, bass, presence, reverb, and again the master and output level. I can't remember for sure what the customer said the problem was with this thing. We're going to test it out. I'll look back over my notes and figure out what the what the deal was with it. But yeah, like I said, you know, we love Mesa Boogies on this channel. Fun to work on. The thing about Mesa Boogies is just, there's usually just so so many options and, and so much stuff crammed on the PCBs that uh, it's there's always a learning curve with one of these. And they have a lot of different models, so it's not like it's not like fi old Fenders where pretty much you know you learn a couple of different models and then everything begins to look the same after that. Well, you know, and it's not always the case with Mesas. Very well made cabinets, I will always say about Mesa. Uh, nicely made cabinets. They usually use uh, really good birch plywood, I believe Baltic birch. Uh, it's always uh, finger jointed, I believe. Very nicely put together on the cabinetry. This model has uh, EL84 tubes in the power section. And we'll take a look probably at the schematic if we can find one. And if we can't find one, I'm going to have to ask them to send me one. And uh, that could be a bit of an adventure. Well, the last time I spoke to anyone from Mesa, they were very nice to me. But also, I uh, put up a video uh, basically saying that, uh, you know, one of their amps was a nightmare to work on. And uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't really like that too much. So, anyway. But on the back side here, we see a fuse holder. We see uh, a switch. This switch is for selecting what you want the EQ to do. You can set it to in or out of circuit. You can also assign it to a channel, rhythm or lead, and you can also make it foot switchable. Uh, this should be a recording output. Uh, we have an effects loop, send and return. Uh, we have an effects mix level. Foot switch, EQ and reverb. Is the foot switch even in here? I don't, I don't see the foot switch. Well, maybe he doesn't have it. I don't know. A lot of times you can uh, you can figure out how uh, old a Mesa is by the serial number. This one's 935. Usually their serial numbers are um, uh, sequential, and they will have the model number, and then they'll have like a number after that, and that's the this is the number of in the run of DC3. So this is the 935th uh, DC3 that they had made. Um, usually that's the way their serial numbers work with Mesa. This would be really tough to get to the preamp tubes because you see the you see the power tubes here on the back, but you see the preamp tubes are way up in there. And if we look, there's a kind of a metal bar that protects the tubes here, and those tubes are on the other side of that bar. So if you were at a gig, you know, and one of your preamp tubes started to act up, uh, you would definitely have to take a break to get that sorted out. This is not uh, this is not a thing where you could reach back in there and wiggle the wiggle the tubes and see if you can get one to shut up, you know, or reach back there and quickly pull one out and change one out. Uh, this is this is going to require you to take a break. Not the easiest thing to get to. Uh, this also doesn't really have oversized transformers like some of their other amplifiers. The transformers are fairly modest in size. Yeah, this is the output transformer, and it's it's not uh, it's not all that big at all. There's also a little. Uh, I'm guessing that is for reverb, but it might be a choke. Maybe that's a choke. Uh, no, two sets of leads. That's a reverb. Uh, then you have a decent sized power transformer back here, but it's not massive. It, this thing is uh, 
a lot less uh, output than some of their bigger amplifiers so you know the transformers can stand to be a little more modest oh another thing that a lot of mesas have is this um uh, silent recording switch and what this does is it allows you to mute the speaker so that you can record so you can come out here and go to a board that's kind of nice if you're in an apartment you know and you're wanting to do your project studio stuff and you know that allows you some flexibility to do that uh, we have a slave out with its own control uh, we have eight ohm four ohm and two four ohm speaker outs Okay, I've got this Mesa Boogie fired up now, and listen to this thing. Sounds sounds a bit crazy. Something's not right. Listen. It's like it's picking up some radio signal or something, some RF interference. It's still there on this channel. It could be that camera or the computer, possibly. Seems to disappear if I move a little away from those. Seems like it's cutting out a little bit here and there. But also notice that the pots are really dirty. Yeah, see like... It's dirty pots. See how it just completely cut out right there. Let's see what's going on with that. Got a, uh, it's got a dirty speaker jack. faders need to be cleaned as well. something funky now it's like it's going distorted I had it on total clean tone and it's you had a little bit of distortion in the background there
noise seems to stop when I switch channels, so I don't know. Preamp issue? So I contact the customer, and what he tells me is that um, he took it to a tech before, and uh, the guy said it needed some new output tubes. So he had the output tubes replaced, and uh, what it was doing before that was red plating after a little while. I mean, he said he could play three or four gigs with this thing, and it would be just fine, and then, you know, suddenly it would start red plating uh, output tubes. Uh, same thing once he got it back after uh, changing power tubes, which I don't, I don't quite understand what he was saying there because these output tubes here, they look pretty old. I mean, that one is definitely an old power tube. That one is an old power tube. You can just tell by the discoloration. Uh, when you first get these, these stickers are white, but this is like, I don't know, maybe, maybe this has just been in a lot of bars and they've turned yellow but that looks like yellow from discoloration from being hot so I would say these tubes and you can just tell by the tubes themselves and by the uh, logos on them and everything they're kind of faded to a grayish where they would have been black originally um, and this one is actually almost to the point where it's kind of missing some lettering here where it's been so so hot so you know that could be from red plating also but it looks to me like uh, and also they're two different uh, sets of tubes, so maybe he just replaced one pair of tubes like this pair um, and left these alone so it could be that one of these was red plating and re replaced these but at any rate it was still doing the same thing uh, after the uh, tech got a hold of it so usually when we have problems with a red plating tube it's if it's not a, the tube itself it is something to do with the bias so the bias is being thrown off so it could also be a that the the bias supply needs to be just completely rebuilt in this thing so um, at any rate those are kind of the things that we're looking at this thing must have been in some smoky bars or some kind of um, really high humid conditions it looks to me because that's the kind of the only way you're going to get something like that is if you are um, in some less than ideal conditions to get that kind of crud on a on a lead like that especially one that's you know always hidden up in being by being plugged in so um, that's just a we're gonna clean this off but you can see the kind of crud that's on there that doesn't really bode well for what might be inside of the Sam let's go ahead and pull this chassis and we'll see what's going on with it what I like to do when pulling chassis like this um, it's easier to pull them if the the amplifier it depends on how heavy the chassis is going to be but on something like this it's kind of a small um, combo so having it set up right like this and everything's detached I like to put um, one hand on one of the transformers and another hand on another transformer if you grab transformers you usually have about the best grip you're gonna get on something like this by pulling on the transformers and holding it by those yeah. I'm stuck on something here hang on Okay, so that's a bit strange. There's four screws that hold this grill on, and the grill is a separate piece from the actual baffle. And when I took the screws out and just tilted the grill down, this was able to get slightly past. I guess it was getting stuck on something on the grill. But also there is there is a piece of uh, you can see it right there. It's like some some weather stripping type stuff. See up in here, and the chassis had to get down and below that and then come back so but yeah the baffle definitely is it's in there you're not getting the baffle out because you can see it's built into a channel and I thought that was the case I didn't think you could remove the baffles in these and yeah the baffles definitely uh, not removable but the grill is be surprised this chassis is actually very light surprisingly light considering how much the uh, amp weighs the chassis is nothing. Alright, so here's the inside of a Mesa Boogie DC3. I do suspect fully that uh, a couple of the preamp tubes are probably going to have to be replaced. And I definitely, I mean, just looking at these power tubes, man, I definitely would uh, highly recommend a, a full set of uh, out, output tubes. You know, the first thing I kind of notice is that this board back here is not in the best of shape. It looks like it's gotten really hot. You see that middle trace right there? 
Uh, the big thick green trace. See how it's kind of folded and bubbled in areas? It just doesn't look very healthy. I mean, I think that one's probably the one that was red plating right there. I mean, just look at it. I want to ins closely inspect as many of these uh, solder joints as I can because this looks to me like a prime candidate for something that's going to have a bad solder joint just because of the way this is constructed. I know for a fact that these this is not the ideal way to do this. I mean, having this board, uh, it'd be better to have, just have a socket and wires, you know, than this board. And it's possible that one or more of these connections, like that one right there, you see that? Yeah, you see that? That's a bad solder joint right there. It looks like to me. Yeah, it definitely is. Look at that. That's not even connected to... to yeah, man. And a lot of these just look crusty. I mean, look how hot this has been. See, that's flux from when this was originally put together. Um, and usually that flux is just kind of uh, clear, more or less. And it, you know, it doesn't show up like that. Um, unless it's just been real hot. And this has been definitely been hot. Because you can see how that flux has just gotten real crusty. That's another bad solder connection, I think. Yeah, definitely. I see that. That one right above it looks bad, too, but I don't think it's going to anything. Yeah, I'm going to reflow all of the solder on these. I'm going to also check. Uh, I might not have to change. Now that I see these solder joints, I may not have to change the capacitors going into that output stage because they're probably not at fault. I will check them, though. I'll figure out which ones are the coupling caps. Or probably, they're over here somewhere. It might be these. And we'll check those, make sure that those are good. Um, also make sure the bias plot, bias supply is uh, is all good. I'll check solder connections on uh, these preamp tubes as well because, you know, these are mounted in a similar fashion. I don't think I'm going to have to pull that big board right there because most of our problem is definitely going to be back here on this board because I've already identified at least, at least two... Uh, bad solder connections, so we're gonna ref. I'm just gonna reflow every single solder connection on this entire board back here. Okay, so let's go ahead and remove this board before we do anything else. I want to be able. Well, I might as well go ahead and take these tubes off out of the socket. So let's go ahead and do that. Yeah, see this? Look at that. You see how the paint has just gone you know more of an orange from a red this thing has been hot and it's probably been hot right there in that one spot so I mean yeah this this oh man I can tell this thing has been really hot you can see actually where it's been red plating on the plate itself it's kinda of hard to see it but underneath there you can see the marks you can see the marks where it's been hot under there I don't know if you're going to be able to see it or not, but it there you can kind of see a circular mark. That looks to me like a spot where that's gotten really hot. Yeah, these tubes are going to need to be replaced. It, it, um, when Once this is done and everything is operating correctly, I mean, look at that. If these were new tubes, then this thing has been just cooking because that doesn't happen. Usually, if the, if the amp is running correctly, um, it takes a long time for JJ's to kind of go this yellow, I mean, just washed out color. And yeah, see the, just, the, just the nicotine stain cooked look of this yellow, you know, yellowed paper? That would have been like bone white originally. Okay, so let's pull this board. Uh, yeah, just looking at these tube socks, these things are filthy too. So this thing has got multiple problems, and it, it probably... Um, kind of got exacerbated by the fact that it was uh, you know starting to cook the output tubes which just kind of sped things along Let's see. there we go that'll stop it from flipping on me um, so yeah I don't know how easy this is going to be to see but these pins in here are just filthy crusty filthy pins see them you see how kind of blackened and filthy they all are? Man, you're not going to get good connection on any of these pins. 
So this, I'm gonna I'm gonna spray the hell out of these and clean the hell out of them for sure. Man, those are some of the crustiest, nastiest pins I think I've seen on a tube amp in a while. I, you just you usually don't see them all black like that. I would say this, and I can smell uh, the, kind of the nicotine in this thing. I don't know if this thing is a comes from the home of a smoker, or if it was borrowed by a smoker, or if uh, it's just been in a lot of smoky bars. Uh, but that that is part of it, I'm sure. But it's definitely um, been around some cigarette smoke in its day. So yeah, at least I have some direction here as to what the issue is. I'm going to also check um, all the resistors on this board. I'm going to check these uh, to make sure they're you know, about the right values. Uh, because as hot as that board has obviously been in the past, those might have um, cooked and drifted. Okay, here's a schematic for the Mesa Boogie DC-3, and one thing I could say for Mesa, um, they do a great job on their schematics. Their documentation of their amps is, is really very nice. Um, here we can see a block diagram. Block diagrams are really useful if you're trying to do diagnosis because uh, it can help you narrow down where something is probably occurring. Like if you're having a certain problem, you can sort of follow the diagram. You can say, oh, well, you know, I know it's before or after uh, this certain control because if I turn that control down it cuts it off and if I turn it up it does you know so you get the idea it, it you can uh, see also which tubes are taking care of which channel and at which stage in the channel okay here is the power supply um, and we can see over here is the bias supply and if we zoom in on it we can see what components uh, are in the, at least the the supply that's coming off of the uh, the transformer um, we need to check these components before we seal everything back up and we'll uh, have to identify them on the board you can see here the rhythm and lead channels uh, the dual master volumes here uh, that go into this uh, this switch which is a relay switch here's the EQ uh, we have an all tube reverb. Uh, V5 is the reverb tube. Okay, here's the output section of the amp. And uh, several things could cause the plates on these output tubes to red plate. And again, loss of bias is the main reason that would happen. Uh, if your cathode becomes disconnected from ground, that's one possibility. Uh, another possibility would be if uh, we lost bias voltage here at the grids, we could have a short of one of these 2.2 meg resistors, I suppose, to ground, which might cause a problem in the, and it, well, it definitely would cause a problem in the bias. One of these resistors here could have drifted far upward. We have a 1.5k resistor here into these tubes that could have also drifted. We could have a leaky capacitor here that's leaking uh, uh, part of this 233 uh, 43 volts we see over here across. Uh, so we will want to check this 0.047 and this 0.047 capacitor. Uh, we will also want to check uh, right here at point E to make sure we have negative 12 volts of uh, bias supply voltage. We'll want to check these 330k resistors here to make sure that they're not shorted or even open so yeah stuff like anything like that that could cause us not to have um, this 11 negative 11 volts present at each one of these grids uh, we will want to check all those components uh, but I am probably about 95 percent certain it is a, a dirty contacts on these tube sockets and probably also those uh, broken solder joints on the other side of the board. Another thing I'm going to do, since all these controls are up here uh, easily exposed um, and turn the right direction, I'm going to go ahead and spray all these out and clean them. Okay, so that's all the controls. I've got the faders cleaned. Now let's go ahead and do all these jacks on the back of the unit.
Okay, the bias circuit is over here in this area. Uh, you can see the bias capacitor right here. We have the this red wire coming in. I think that is the color that's supposed to come into the bias supply. And yes, that's correct. We have a connector here uh, that brings in everything from the power supply. So what I want to do is I want to unhook this and clean these contacts. Just make sure that they're getting good connection. Okay, we're going to clean these sockets, and uh, for that purpose, we're going to use these. You can get these just about anywhere. I'll put a link down in the description, though, if you want to uh, get some off Amazon. They're basically uh, go betweens, they, they clean between your teeth, and what they are is just really tiny uh, brushes, and they're perfect for this application. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so there are all the sockets clean, and that's how to clean them with a interdental brush. Okay, now we're going to go through this board, and we're going to uh, reflow every solder joint on this board. Okay, so I've um, reflowed all the solder on this board, and what I'm going to do now is stick some uh, tubes back in here, and uh, I'm going to do some tests of some voltage, uh, particularly over here on these two capacitors, because these are the two capacitors that are right before the output stage. And what I want to see is if uh, the DC is getting blocked. We also have a couple of um, resistors here, some 330Ks that the signal passes through. I've tested those and those seem okay. You know, you're not going to get an accurate reading in circuit, but they're close enough that I believe they're fine. Also, I've tested the um, resistors that are on this board as well, and all of those seem consistent with what I should see. Uh, so, those are correct. I've looked at all, I've inspected all of these solder joints where the wires are coming up onto this board and those seem to be okay uh, so I think we're pretty much there we've cleaned the sockets we've reflowed the solder and I think this the reflowing the solder was the main thing because I think what was going on is he said when you this this problem only reared its head whenever uh, you had been playing this amp for a long time um, and you know some gigs it, or some gigs or some practices it would be fine the whole time uh, so you know it's definitely a heat related issue and I think uh, there were definitely a couple of these solder joints that were um, uh, definitely broken solder joints so hopefully fingers crossed this is going to take care of it but we do need to ch uh, check these coupling caps right here and make sure that they are doing their jobs and blocking the DC okay so I just want to stick the output tubes back in this thing and we're gonna um, hook it up to load here on the desk and fire it up briefly and like I said before, these tubes um, definitely need to be changed. These things have been cooked. And I mean cooked. Okay, let's see what kind of bias voltages we're getting here. Uh, this thing is running really 127 watts of power consumption for an amp like this. That seems excessive to me. 1.2 amps of current draw. Yeah, I don't know about that. Alright, let's check some voltages here. I, um, I expect to see... 286 volts on that side and 12.8 volts on the other side so that's I think that's about right it's about what the schematic call for 276 on that side and negative 12.8 on the other side 
negative 11.5 volts on the grid there negative 11.5 on the grid there negative 11.5 on the grid there and negative 11.5 on the grid there so that's close to what the schematic calls for I still don't see any red plating on the tubes they do smell hot but I don't see any you know I they and they seem just hot from being over them but I mean that's EL84s for you too they do run hot but it's man 126 watts I mean look 126 watts of power consumption 1.2 amps it just seems a bit excessive to me yeah see there's no red plating going on here so you know I don't know okay the power consumption question notwithstanding uh, I think we have this thing pretty much ready to go I mean that it's operating correctly um, and I think you know given the things that I saw on that output tube board it would definitely explain why these output tubes were red plating on and off at certain times but we've gone through and I've checked um, I've checked that we have about a, ne a negative 11 volts on all of the grids which we do I've checked uh, again these resistors here the uh, 1.5 K's I've checked these 220 K's and those are okay I've checked these 330 K's and those are okay I've checked these 0 0.047 capacitors and both of those are doing their job I did check the voltage here at the E point and uh, or actually even a little further back I checked uh, some of the stuff in the bias um, supply here I think everything is actually fine I'm gonna let this burn in for a little while uh, with the tubes that are currently in it uh, and just to make sure that they don't start to red plate on me okay so it's been about 20 or 30 minutes with this thing on and I just came back to start turning some knobs and seeing uh, how everything works the knobs are all clean uh, everything is working really nicely on the no as far as the knobs go no issues there um, but when I when I play with the EQ here a couple of these I can kind of wiggle them Kind of getting some noises so uh, I think what I'm gonna have to do here is uh, pull this board and uh, reflow all the solder on the back of this board because I think what's happening is as I move uh, as I move these back and forth it's kind of moving this little housing here uh, which is which is stressing uh, the the little solder joints here so And I can actually see that solder joint moving. Yeah, that solder joint right there. You see it moving whenever I move this? See, it's not, I don't think that's even soldered on entirely. And the same may be true for some of these other solder joints. That one there looks a bit too blobby to be the issue, but I think on the other side there's going to be another contact. So I need to bring this board out and see uh, where we're losing contact on a couple of these. I think these little, I think these little plastic standoffs right there, uh, those just kind of pop out. They're like little compression standoffs. There's two of them up here. I don't know if there's someone that, well, there's another couple of them right there in the middle. Alright, there's that one coming out. Those two, those two right there are going to try to be a problem. Those bottom ones. Oh, this is not, uh, not easy to get to. There we go. There's that one. Compress this one just a bit. There we go. Now then. Okay. So 
that wasn't too bad. Kind of a weird, weird way of doing that though. Um, this is also going to allow me to clean this, these uh, faders just a little bit better. Okay, so there, it does come out. It's not easy, but it does come out without removing the main board. So, so that's good. There is a lot of just gooey. Uh, man, that's just very gooey. Um, and I think that's the old. That's the old grease. And it's just it's just really kind of gummed up. Okay, I'm gonna spray some fader lube down in these. Cleaner. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna alcohol clean them first because there's so much grease. Okay, that's clean with alcohol first, and we're just gonna let that evaporate, and then we'll come back with some uh, fader lube and cleaner. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, reflow some of these solder joints. Yeah, the problem with the problem with faders is after a while they just get the grease um, that's used from the factory uh, on these faders uh, just gums up. Um, it just gets harder and harder to move the faders. So cleaning that out of there is going to, I think it's going to help a lot. It's going to help keep contact as well as the faders are used. But we can go ahead and we'll use some lube and cleaner, some actual deoxit fader F100 cleaner, and that should restore some lubricant in there. I'm going to go ahead and reflow all the solder on this board, especially this one, because this one's definitely not making contact. Okay, so there's all the solder of that board reflowed and the, the main problem contact was that one right there and I added a lot of solder to that so it expands the expands the grip of the contact so whenever you move that shouldn't it shouldn't move now all right let's fire back up and try it again and see if um, we're still having the same problem I mean I don't I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get it to completely disappear because it might be contacts down inside of the fader itself so without replacing the actual fader I might not be able to get it to completely stop doing that when you sit here and wiggle it but at least um, at least the contacts you know I, I know are secure now so stop doing it cool The base doesn't seem to be doing anything. It doesn't seem to be affecting the base. Like that one obviously works. That one obviously works. That one obviously works. And that one works. But the, I'm not sure about the base. Um, I'm thinking, oh, that's broken. That's broken off. All right, so I need to do something about that. We gotta pop this thing back out of here again. You can see what I mean. That's a little, some kind of little, uh, what is that? I'm gonna look on the schematic. What is that thing? Is that a little coil, little inductor of some kind? I think it's an inductor. 
<clears throat> yeah, um, here is the graphic EQ board. We can see right here each one of these faders is connected to a resistor and also a little inductor and also a capacitor. The inductor is broken off on the base. And I noticed that when I was first playing around with this amp too, that that 80 hertz uh, slider didn't seem to be doing anything at all whenever I would move it around. And I guess that's why. I just chalked it up to, you know, not having it loud enough to, for it to reproduce those lower frequencies, but I think it was already, uh, it was already broken. So, see this inductor? This one is attached to the 80 hertz, and look at that. It's just loose like a, it's like a loose tooth. Yeah, see, there's no, there's no lead there. It's broken off. See, I'm not going to be able to even get into this, because this is epoxy. All right, so that's kind of a, that's a bummer. It's worth noting, this is the same FC3E board that's been used and a lot of different mesas. This one is uh, labeled 1986 and that's probably uh, when this particular board was designed. So I mean this is the same board you see in a lot of different mesas. Uh, so I'm hoping they either have this little part or it's going to be a common enough part that I can get it somewhere. Okay, I have looked and looked around on the on the net for this inductor. I believe this is made by Falco Electronics and I think this is the uh, model number for this particular inductor which is one Henry uh, the thing is uh, like I said I've looked everywhere I can't find it I have not yet called Mesa boogie which will be my next plan of attack but right now it's real late at night so they're not gonna be in anyway but so I'm gonna see if I can possibly repair this one I the idea here is to uh, open this up if I can I don't think this is epoxy at first I thought it was epoxy but it's not as you can see, it's pliable, so I think I'm going to be able to get get this kind of cut away here and stripped off the back, and I might be able to get access enough uh, to remove this little lead right here and replace it with hopefully another uh, lead. That's the idea. So we'll see how it goes. See if I can do this without cutting myself. Okay, I've reached copper there. And hopefully I didn't damage anything. Uh, yeah, see there's a there's a little tiny bit of copper right there too, so I think I may have Yeah, I, I think I've damaged I think I've destroyed it now. Shit. Oh well. Oh well, it was a valiant effort. Let's uh Let's do a measurement on it, just to confirm what I believe to be the case that I've destroyed this thing. Yep, it's open now. Shit. Alright, well there's that, that idea out the window. Okay, I was doing some Google image searches here to try to find the part, and uh, I did come across this group where they were talking about uh, uh, the, the EQ for these mesas and I could go down through here and show you all of this. So they do have the schematic and they're talking about some different things uh, having to do with uh, m actually making these things, recreating them. Um, I'm not sure to what end they're trying to recreate some of them but it looks like here uh, this photo is from Tube Amp Doctor, and I can't really quite tell what it is, but it looks like maybe Tube Amp Doctor makes or sells replacement. Okay, so I did a search for Tube Amp Doctor Mesa EQ Inductor, and it does come up with something. So let's see what we have here. Inductor Mesa Boogie for Graphic EQ. Bam. One Henry. There it is, right there. What? Is, they want Euros. So it's going to have to come all the way from Europe. That's going to suck. Yeah, it looks like the part's going to be in Germany. 
Let me see if somebody in the U.S. stocks this. Uh, this is part number ZMBEQ1000. So that's 1,000 microhenries. Okay, it's the next day. Uh, we're going to call Mason now. Let's see if we can get a part. Thank you for calling Mesa Boogie. Our office hours are Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you know your party's extension, you may dial it now. For customer service, press 6. For repairs, press 7. For artist relations, press 8. Accounts payable, 330. Transferring call. Please hold. Yeah, hey Rich. Uh, it's been a long time since I spoke to you. Um, this is Brad Lindsay. How are you doing, man? Hi, how can I help you? Uh, I've got a DC3. It's kind of an older one. It's on my bench, and uh, it needs it needs one of the one Henry inductors on the uh, the little FC3 EQ board. Do you guys stock those, or where can I get them? Yeah. Okay. We have. I'll tell you the price in a moment here. Okay. Check stock. Hold on, please. Part number is 519401, and it's in stock, and it goes for $3.95 plus mail cost. Okay, uh, I want one. Can I go ahead and put it on order? You can. Um, I should warn you, though, that I don't, don't have any um, real economical mail cost to offer. I can only offer priority mail, because that's the only kind of mail we're offering at the moment. Yeah, I understand. UPS, but I understand. what. So it'll be like 10 bucks or something, or... Well, the shipping will be seven dollars and fifteen cents. Or right, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. When did you guys stop making the DC three? Oh, geez, it's been a long time ago. Yeah, I think we, we stopped making it about fifteen years ago or so. Yeah, yeah, it's more of a '90s, like '93 was the first year for those, something like that. Um, maybe that or slightly later, '93, '94 sounds about right. To okay. Me. I remember when the boss first introduced it. I remember he said. Hey, I discovered the problem. by adding an extra 12x7, I could eliminate some LDR switching devices. LDRs were being used for channel switching. Yeah, that. yeah. It's a nice amp. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't like the power board on the back because it's gotten hot over the years. But uh, other than that, yeah, it's it's, it's great well, sounding. I think our 84 amps all run really hot. That's kind of a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you, do you have a suggestion on on those? Do you have a, a service bulletin by chance? Well. My, the service bulletin is just um, verbally transmitted in that try to order cooler running tubes if you're ordering them from us. Okay. We know what that means and which ones we should send. Um, if you're ordering non-Mesa tubes, though, I don't know how, how you determine what, which ones hot, run hotter versus cooler. But uh, in our world, we have a color word that indicates hotness or coolness of the tube. And it's kind of what you would think. Um, but the word uh, blue or gray listed on the bottom of the tube information strip tends to run hotter, but ones that run in the yellow, red, or green color codes tend to run a little cooler. Right. So if you're ordering Mesa tubes, you'd want to specify yellows, reds, or greens. Do you guys do all that, uh, the tube testing in-house there? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I may actually order a, a set I need, I need to get with my customer and, and see what he wants to do uh, on that. So, um... Gosh, it's possible I might call you back. But go ahead and send me this part because I know I'm going to need this for sure. Okay, Brad. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, man. Thank Bye. You. Talk to you later. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. All right, it's been several days since I spoke to Mesa, and the uh, new inductor has arrived. And there's the part number, 519401. But yeah, let's go ahead and get this thing installed, and uh, I think we'll be just about done after that. We're going to check bias on those output tubes for sure, and uh, maybe uh, get in there and modify the bias circuit slightly so that... Um, uh, these so that these run a little bit cooler those uh, amps are known for running hot so uh, and you can you know you can definitely tell it from these tubes how hot this amp has run even if the thing is not red plating um, on more than one tube I mean every one of these is severely discolored 
and has obviously been running hot. So um, we're going to get in there and probably modify that bias circuit, bring the bias down a little bit, cool cool these tubes off so that they uh, so that they aren't cooking quite so much. And uh, yeah, I think it's just going to be a better better amplifier if we can do that. It'll be definitely more stable, uh, more reliable. All right, we got this Mesa back up on the desk, and it's time to get her fixed. So let's go ahead and put that inductor back in, and I think we'll be ready to go with it. Yeah, that's, that might just push it through. There we go. Like extracting a tooth. Let's see. I'm, uh... That's gonna get it. That that one doesn't look like it's soldered, but it is. So there it is. That's back together. Let's um, let's pop it back in and test it out now. All right. The other thing we need to do is uh, pop some new tubes in this thing and uh, check the bias. And we're probably gonna end up adjusting the bias on this amplifier. Okay. The tubes I've chosen to put in this are some uh, soft text. These are. Pretty reliable and they are uh, fairly inexpensive but the thing is I'm not sure exactly which are the pairs I think it's the inner ones and the outer ones that's what they had in here formerly they had the inner ones and the outer ones paired up and you don't necessarily have to have a matched quad of output tubes uh, as long as you get the pairs matched and that's what I have here they are actually very close to being a matched quad anyway but what I want to do here is measure the bias so what we're gonna do First thing we need to do is measure uh, from the plate of the out, one of the output tubes to the center tap. So from there, from that side to that side, let's uh, measure that resistance. Okay, we have 75 ohms on that side, and on the other side, we have about the same, about 75 ohms. So we will write that down in our little book. We'll have 75 ohms. Now we're going to fire up the amp and we're going to measure the voltage drop from those two points. Man, this thing is sure pulling some power. 139 watts. That just really seems on the high side. Okay, but we're going to measure the voltage drop from here to there. And we've got 5.4, we'll call it 5.4 and 5.0. And we also need a measurement of the uh, plate voltages. 414 volts on that side 414 volts on that side so 414 volts plate let's kill it before it kills us damn those tubes are cooking man those suckers are just i mean el34s get hot but man that is that is smoking hot those suckers are hot let's see what the plate dissipation is this ought to be interesting. 
we'll try one side first here. 5.4, divide that by the resistance. And that is going to be our current. And we'll multiply that by 414, and that's 29.8. We'll divide that by 2 because we have two tubes over there. 14.9, it's actually not that bad, but it is on the high side. Now the uh, maximum plate dissipation for a single EL84 uh, tube is 12 watts. So we're three watts above that on, on that one side. Let's check the other side. So five divided by 75 times 414. That's a little less. Still high. So what we need to do is uh, we're going to come in here and modify this bias circuit. Okay, so if we look at the schematic, uh, here's our negative 12 volt bias supply coming in on E. And that's a point at which uh, two 330K resistors meet. So we have two 330Ks meeting right there at E. And if we go up to where E uh, connects to the rest of the bias supply, um, right here, we have a 33K on the other side of that. So the way to affect the, vi the bias supply on this amplifier is to change the value of this 33K. That resistor right there. So now what we might do here in the beginning is run a couple of leads in there. Uh, just some temporary um, leads that we can come out of it. And then we can, that way we can experiment with resistors and we won't have to solder and desolder several times. Okay, I reinstalled that 33K because it just wasn't, that position wasn't affecting things enough. So um, I'm going to move a little further down the line to this resistor. That one's 120K. We're going to change this one out and see if that affects it because that's where the supply is originating from. Same thing. I want to come in here with uh, with a couple of wires. First, we got to remove the these leads. I've already got a, a two. Well, I might not go quite that low. We'll change it to like a. I think we may just cut it in half at first and see what that does to our voltage. So I don't know. We'll go like a maybe a 50k, something like that. Okay, so there's a 68K soldered into that spot. And again, I can kind of watch my power consumption over here, and that's going to give me some clues. Geez, it's only at 62 watts. 65, it's climbing, but yeah, we're on the right track. 468 volts. 468 and 0.77. Okay, so now we're way under. So what we need to do is go closer to our 120 uh, without quite going up to it. So we need to go maybe 100. Let's try 100. Okay, now we're going to try 100K and see what that does. Our power consumption is up past 100 watts. So that's closer to where we were before. And closer to where we need to be for sure. 435 on the uh, plate voltage and we'll just check one side here 3.7 so let's try that 3.7 divided by 75 times 435 divided by 2 10.73 now that is fairly close Uh, we'll slap in this 100k resistor in this place of that 120. That's going to bring our plate dissipation for each output tube down from about a, uh, 14 watts per tube to about a uh, little over 10 watts per tube. And what that's going to do, uh, that's going to make this amp actually uh, break up a little sooner on the output. You know, it's going to have a little bit less headroom, but it's also going to keep these tubes from cooking and it's going to keep the board from cooking. It's Everything's going to run just a lot cooler. I think this is going to get us where we need to be. Yep, 
Don't ever let anybody tell you you can't buy us Mesa amplifiers. <laughs> Thank you. 
Alright, so that'll do it for this uh, early 1990s Mesa Boogie DC-3 dual caliber. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have, please hit subscribe down below, and we'll see y'all later.